the partition of the Indian subcontinent, the first time in 1947, is just two years less than 60 years old. Yet not all pains of the grievous partition have been assuaged. The two newborn nations, India and Pakistan, have not yet come to terms with their destiny, nor have they resolved most differences among themselves. Taking a bold people's initiative, women in security, conflict management and peace has been organizing conflict transformation workshops in Delhi for the last four years. The workshop of October 2005 underscored the role of youth and the future leaders on both sides of the border and sought creative ways to engage them in dialogue. We managed visas when no visas were being issued. We interacted when interaction was at its lowest step and our network grew stronger. So to engage with the potentialities of dialogue, the philosophy of it, the skill of it, a profound shift of consciousness of terrain has to occur. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly walk you through the history of the uh, WISCOM country transformation workshop. We need to develop leadership models that will help us transform the conflict uh, and build uh, relationships. Um, now you are the next generation and when we work with the next generation, we keep in mind three things, uh, motivation, skills and expertise. Though the workshop focused specifically on Indo-Pak relations, it did begin with and had several broad conceptual and empirical references to peace building, leadership, conflict transformation and negotiations in conflict situations. Leadership should be based on a reflective dialogue. Those who are to elect a leader or those uh, who the leader claim to, to lead. And this is, a, as I see it, a purified process. The idea of uh, the leadership of ideas was <laughs> the leadership of individuals and the ability to inject new ideas at different levels of engagement in, both in civil society and government is, is, a, is an extremely exciting possibility. The key question is, to, is, is we need to have people who are willing to kind of just really keep monitoring, keeping, keeping tabs on all of the different, all of the different um, uh, offers, counter-offers, um, offers and rejections. What you're trying to do, what you need to do, is to balance the negative peace aspect of peace building with the positive peace aspect. The workshop explored the concept, contours and impact of conflicts in the subcontinental context in particular and several global contexts in general. First of all, I think Kashmir is a far more diverse and complex problem than Orland ever was. Um, Orland was solved with the help of the international community. I think that every Kashmiri more or less has a first-hand uh, knowledge and experience of conflict. Now the conflict has been raging there for the past 16 years and I have just uh, lost all my hair but I am yet to experience what uh, what the beauty of life would have been. They have tried to give some kind of an explanation for uh, the emergence of conflict. Now what they say is that all human beings, all human beings, all individuals are born with certain physical and non-physical needs which are universal. The Indo-Pak conflict is rooted in decades of history and in the politics of the ruling elites on both sides of the border. Several speakers tried to grapple with the complex and multiple issues raised in this context. Almost all echoed the view that war is not the way to solve the conflict. Uh, the question of violence, uh, uh, support which Pakistan has given over the years uh, to violence in Kashmir, uh, terrorism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, some Pakistani like to call it the freedom struggle. Uh, in, in, all right, even if it's the freedom struggle, there's a freedom struggle going on in Gilgit in Pakistan. We have wisely kept away from it. 
However, in spite of the conflict raging for decades now, the peace process in our subcontinent has got an impetus in recent times, and the Indo-Pak relations are poised for a major leap forward. The economic rationale for better relations in the subcontinent has also found many takers and vocal advocates sustaining composite dialogue in the subcontinent through the exploration of justice and peace building was discussed at great length. Indeed, this was the seminal contribution of the workshop. This is the first time I find that the, the two leaders' chemistry is working. Uh, one is born in Delhi, happens to be Pakistan's leader, and the other is born in Pakistan, happens to be the leader. <laughs> this is the first time that you have an Indian opposition and the government on the same track. That is the third factor, which I feel that for the first time, the international community is taking interest in you know, sustaining this dialogue between India and Pakistan. Fourth factor is decreased awareness among all of us. Only if we stop our localized conflict, our economies can gain a lot from that. It might be difficult for Indian manufacturers to compete with the subsidized organizations which are run by the military foundations. They are highly subsidized. So we must think out of the box, think of other ways of developing trade links, uh, um, going for free trade agreements, in maybe bilateral with other countries and then have Pakistan move in. The progress on, on this score really has been very, very useful. And Article 7 of the Indus Treaty, the two parties recognize that they have a common interest in the optimum development of the river. And to that end, declare their intention to cooperate by mutual agreement to the fullest possible extent. That is, optimization over and beyond the division that has taken place. It is only natural that the security discourse became the focal point of the workshop in several sessions. More than one interpretation of security from the state and the people's perspectives were offered by the scholars. A shift has come in security. Security of the state is now replaced by the demand of the people. Security of the people, security of the individual. I see security of human being. And in this way we coined the term human security. It would be misleading to say that there is a direct correlation that every track to meeting or interaction provides tangible solutions as far as the government or as far as track one are concerned. But I do think it serves a very useful purpose in shaping and in contributing to the discourse about security issues, political issues and whatever be the nature of the contestation. Several sessions and discussions beyond the formal sessions dealt with the non-state actors and their role in peace building and explored civil society approaches, thereby underscoring the fact that peacemaking was not the sole prerogative of governments. There were these uh, nuclear explosions in 1998 and Pakistan Peace Coalition came into being as a coalition of several peace movements that emerged in Pakistan in the wake of uh, nuclear tests. And then following that, uh, uh, this uh, CNDP, um, Committee for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace in India. It is those who make war who are left to make peace. And therefore, when there is a militarized war, you're left with a militarized peace. And it is civil society initiatives which can ensure otherwise. Media to an extent, has played a crucial role in South Asia, both in aggravating the situation and also in improving both formal and informal ties among the two nations. Media on both sides has created enormous problems in the relationship between the two countries. I believe it's not just television, it's the entire media which can play a very constructive role in bringing the two people together. And uh, it has actually. <laughs> theatre and music were put forth in their most creative manner as means of building bridges among peoples and nations. The role of cinema 
with regard to partition and the situation thereafter in the subcontinent was explored through an audiovisual presentation. have become for our generation, I'm not the partition generation, but for generations that came after the partition, in many ways they formed the historical memory of the partition. Partition is a relative term. It means different things to different people at different levels of subdivision. The partition has never been a solution. Instead, the solution itself has been the problem. Along with media, the workshop tried to look at the role of textbooks and educational systems and institutions in both countries with regard to conflict and peace building. Half of the country is uh, illiterate. Um, two thirds of the children, the school age children, do not find the opportunity of going to school. They remain out of school. Um, and then those who go to school get extremely bad education, very poor facilities, very bad books, very unchallenging examinations, and extremely bad teachers. The connection between gender and conflict transformation was explored, particularly in the context of Kashmir. that the design and impact of any particular program may not be the same for both men and women. It takes these different needs and perspectives into account and this results in more effective policies and programs. We can't have gender neutral peace building. We need to have gender sensitive, so we need to move the discourse in the direction of gender sensitive peace building work. We the women folk of India and Pakistan, where abject poverty holds sway have to suffer the most if 45% of the population of the sub subcontinent lives below the poverty line. It makes 40 crores in India and 5 crores in Pakistan. Perhaps the most touching, participative and productive part of the workshop was the series of presentations by young future leaders from both sides of the border on resolving the Kashmir conflict and on looking at the Indo-Pak peace-building processes from fresh perspectives. The Chanab formula solves the water problem for Pakistan. Um, India has been held in violation of Indus Water Treaty by building the Baglihar Dam on River Chanab, uh, which reduces the water flow to Pakistan by seven to 8,000 Q6 uh, every day. There's no question of redefining the borders. India is very clear on that. So Chanab formula falls flat on that very ground. There's no question of redefining India's borders. And to the point of uh, India violating the Indus, wa Indus Water Treaty. It is known that the disputed, any disputed project has come to a halt. So uh, that is something to be questioned. The issue of Kashmir will continue to remain foregrounded in the political discourses of both India and Pakistan. And inevitably, I think they will get implicated into the domestic political processes and mobilizations on both sides of India and Pakistan. So, I mean, the question of, you know, who's exercising more influence. The workshop marks, undoubtedly, a silent, subtle, yet a significant watershed in the history of people's initiatives in South Asian peace building. Several delegates had positive feedback and provided suggestions for the future. It was not only the last nine days which we spent here, it was ages which we spent together. And so much we've learned in just these nine days. I cannot express it. I was really interested to know, I want to meet people uh, in the flesh and know what they're, they're actually thinking about and get rid of all of those preconceived notions that we have about one another. And that's what I'm going to take back home. Lots of posters of Shah Rukh Khan mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and um, hope for a far much uh, better future. That peace is not to be imposed from above 
That peace is the consequence of shared vision among people in general of the conflicting states. That peace also involves unstructured and informal ways and means of looking at each other and knowing and appreciating the uniqueness and strengths of each other. These are some of the unforgettable lessons of this workshop. Lessons that will remain long in the hearts and minds of the 40-odd young participants from India and Pakistan. We love.